Yes, no, no, sir. You can start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Narayan, you can go ahead. Okay, sir. Sir, okay, sir. Live over there. Please go ahead, Narayana. Ah, uh, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Narayan Reddy. I am doing my IDC at Medicare Hospitals. And uh, today, my topic of discussion is evidence-based review on management of acute liver failure. So, uh, liver disease. Uh, liver disease. It's the fifth largest cause of death, and it is largely preventable. And there is fivefold increase in the rates of cirrhosis aged 33 to 55 years in the last 10 years. And the three most common causes include alcohol-related obesity, that's fatty liver, and uh, viral hepatitis. And the disease-related mortality it has increased sixfold in the last 30 years. And admissions and deaths are rising by 8 to 10 percent per year. So all this is, uh, it includes both acute liver failure, acute on chronic liver failure, and chronic liver failure. So regarding today's topic, I will discuss about first physiology of liver and definition of acute liver failure. How do you evaluate? How do you manage medical management, liver assist devices, plasma exchange, and liver transplantation? So first, uh, there are numerous, some hundreds of functions of liver. Out of these, these are the main functions like metabolic, metabolic functions, and it stores vitamins, minerals, and sugar balance like uh, gluconeogenesis, glycogen, cell, and it produces proteins, all the important proteins in the body, the albumin, and important in the bile synthesis, fat digestion, absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, K, and production of coagulation factors, and complement proteins, opsonins. It's also important in the detoxification of drugs, ammonia. So uh, there are different terminologies. One is severe acute liver injury, acute liver failure, subacute liver failure, and acute and chronic liver failure. So severe acute liver injury, it includes jaundice with coagulopathy, that is INR greater than 1.5. I usually these patients may recover, and but they may also progress to acute liver failure. And acute liver failure, it it includes hepatic encephalopathy along with jaundice and uh, coagulopathy. And the subacute liver failure. Jaundice, it is followed by ascites, and uh, this coagulopathy, it will be very late in subacute liver failure, and it has very high mortality over three months. And acute on chronic liver failure, it includes the CLD changes, the portal hypertension, uh, ascites, jaundice, hepatic encephalopathy. So definition, so it was originally acute liver failure was originally defined by Trey and Davidson in 1970 as permanent liver failure which was potentially reversible condition, the consequence of severe liver injury with an onset of encephalopathy within eight weeks of appearance of first symptoms and in the absence of, absence of pre-existing liver disease. So now uh, we are following O'Grady system, which includes hyperacute liver failure, acute liver failure, and subacute liver failure. This uh, we consider jaundice as the first symptom and hyperacute liver failure. It describes the patient's in whom encephalopathy develops within seven days of onset of jaundice. And acute liver failure, we include patients whose encephalopathy develops between uh, the onset of second week to four weeks. And subacute liver failure, it's from five to 12 weeks of jaundice onset. So if a patient is having, patient develops encephalopathy after 12 weeks of onset of jaundice, we categorize it as CLD. And why the subclassification is important because it is it helps in the prognostication of patients. Uh, because subacute liver failure has a very low chance of spontaneous survival, whereas uh, hyperactive presentations has a greater chance of spontaneous recovery despite uh, extra hepatic organ failure. And also, uh, and one more prerequisite before we label it as acute liver failure is there should be absent of previous fibrotic or cirrhotic chronic liver disease. And there are few exceptions uh, to this. These are autoimmune hepatitis, but Chiari syndrome, Wilson's disease, and reactivation of hepatitis B. So causes of liver failure. And one more thing, uh, whenever a patient comes with the liver failure, 
we have to rule out the causes rule out chronic causes also because they may not warrant uh, liver transplantation so these are the main causes of liver failure it includes broad categories include infection metabolic diseases drugs toxins acute liver failure of pregnancy autoimmune hepatitis acute bacteria syndrome shock liver and individual etiological agents includes other uh, infections most common as heptotropic viruses a to a b c d e and other uh, rare causes include cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex virus and wilson's disease wilson's disease usually presents as chronic liver disease but sometimes it may present as acute liver failure and the drugs include paracetamol uh, antibiotics that is anti tubercular drugs isoniazid rifampicin anti epileptics like valproate and mushroom poisoning that is amanitophalloids and the different etiologicals worldwide uh, in india it's viral hepatitis which is the most common cause a and e and non a non e whereas in the western world paracetamol drug induced is the most common cause of uh, liver failure so whenever a patient comes with fever jaundice and encephalopathy we should not directly jump into the patient is having liver failure first the, we should rule out the most common causes like tropical infections malaria enteric fever leptospira and dengue and uh, other causes include meningitis encephalitis and sepsis with multi organ dysfunction and uh, gall bladder involvement like cholangitis and we have to rule out cld and ruling out cld uh is there a role of biopsy before ruling out cld because uh, biopsy is an invasive procedure and these people they have coagulopathy so there are high chance of uh, bleeding so if at all uh, we have to do liver biopsy it is performed by preferably by transjugular route in a center experienced where it is commonly doing these procedures so liver biopsy helps in mainly ruling out the alcohol induced liver disease malignancies and cld okay so then how do you evaluate a patient who comes with liver failure so routine investigations like cbc and liver functional tests electrolytes and sugars urea renal function test like blood urea creatinine acid base gas analysis and uh, coagulopathy screening with pti and nr aptt and important things uh, for etiology we should send toxicology screen in the urine and uh, serum paracetamol levels and serological screen for viral infections like hbsag anti hbc igm hbv dna and anti hcv igm anti hcv igm anti hsv igm for rare causes like herpes simplex virus varicella zoster virus and we have to also Uh, rule out autoimmune diseases with uh, ana profile anti smooth muscle antibodies anti soluble liver antigens and anca hla typing all this we have to do and uh, uh, for assessing the severity disease severe type disease pti nr factor 5 and coagulation screening includes fibrinogen so regular assessment of all these tests are important and ultrasound we have to rule out cld changes any gall bladder involvement and uh, vasculature to look for any bacteria syndrome all these things we have to rule out and management uh, general management like metabolic disturbances first first is hypoglycemia so uh, metabolic disturbances are very common because uh, hypoglycemia it's a very very well recognized complication uh, in acute liver failure because 50% of uh, acute liver failure patients they have decreased glycogen stores and there is bit decreased gluconeogenesis and one more important thing is and we'll confuse hypoglycemia with hepatic and worsening of hepatic encephalopathy so it's important to monitor blood sugar levels every 2 to 3 hours so uh, the blood sugar levels falls below 60 mg per deciliter it right? and uh, correction with 25% dextrose 50 ml of 100 ml should be administered and uh, it will help in minimizing total fluid administration so one more thing we need to avoid hyperglycemia also because there is paper article telling patients with diabetes mellitus are prone to develop severe hepatitis and liver failure due to high hepatitis viral infection and this hyperglycemia it all it may also increase intracranial pressure so it's very important to close monitoring of sugars and phosphorus this is an article published uh, 
okay uh, phosphorus as an early predictive factor in patients with acute liver failure so uh, phosphorus less than 2.5 the percentage of recovery is very high rather than phosphorus being high so hypophosphatemia is considered as a very favorable prognostic sign because it appears to be associated with liver regeneration and when the patient is having hypophosphatemia it's very important to even correct to avoid serious organ dysfunction associated with it and uh, regarding 3% ns other electrolyte abnormalities hypokalemia is we need to correct hypokalemia because it may also uh, uh, contribute to increase in the ammonia levels and further worsening of hepatic encephalopathy and all the other other like uh, hyponatremia hypocalcemia hypomagnesemia you need to correct them and hyponatremia it's important uh, to maintain sodium between 145 and 155 so it's very important uh, we, we correct with infusion of uh, hypotonic saline and with hypotonic saline there are also studies which show that there is decreased vasopressor requirement during first 36 hours of infusion and we should avoid hypernatremia sometimes rarely we may have to initiate uh, renal replacement therapy to correct hyponatremia so then infection the most important part is infection because people uh, with acute liver failure they are prone to develop infections sepsis septic shock uh, it is one of the leading cause of death infectious complications are one of the leading cause of death in acute liver failure patient so among liver failure bacterial infections are most common and among bacterial infections 60 to 80% of patients 50% uh, of patients they have pneumonia and 20% uh, of uti and catheter related infections because these patients they have uh, they may need invasive lines and uh, then when there is worsening of uh, hepatic encephalopathy we may need to intubate them so all these uh, may contribute to infection so uh, we have to give absolute attention to hand washing and strict aseptic asepsis should be followed when lines are manipulated and fungal infections they can also occur in one third of patients uh, requiring uh, who may stay in icu for long time and and how to diagnose uh, infection in liver failure patients because uh, so clinical features are most often uh, non specific and uh, crp procal levels they are frequently unhelpful so uh, frequent screen screening we have to do with uh, blood urine and appropriate samples for cultures so when we send cultures so when there is deterioration in hepatic encephalopathy there is worsening of hepatic encephalopathy there is continuous fever uh, and uh, established renal failure and uh, rise in tlc hypotension these are some of the indications where we send we send repeat cultures and we start antibiotics so uh, empirical antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics sh should be administered to patients with acute liver failure who have signs of systemic inflammatory response syndrome refractory hypotension and unexplained progression to higher grades of hepatic encephalopathy and one more thing uh, whether there is any role of prophylactic antibiotics in acute liver failure there are no control trials confirming that there is a use of prophylactic antimicrobials so uh, this is there is no survival benefit with prophylactic antibiotic but uh, it's indicated they only one of the most common indication for prophylactic antibiotics is uh, it is indicated for those patients who are listed for super urgent liver transplantation since the development of infection and sepsis may cause delisting of these patients these are common organisms which cause uh, which is the cause for sepsis in acute liver failure patients and coagulopathy so uh, there is no indication of transfusion of ffp or any other blood products unless there is active bleeding so uh, rather than uh, routine uh, ptn or aptt other coagulation parameters thromboelastography will help us in understanding which factors are deficient which factors we have to supplement everything and vitamin k supplementation is also not routinely indicated 
so and one more thing a trace elements uh, trace elements we have to replace and zinc zinc block hepatitis c virus replication by inhibiting viral rna dependent rna polymerase so and uh, predictive value of ammonia so it is important to carefully monitor ammonia levels and how do you do arterial ammonia is preferred to venous ammonia because venous ammonia uh, may have lower levels of uh, ammonia compared to arterial ones and but when serial levels are taken there is no much difference between arterial and venous ammonia and this hyperammonemia it contributes to cerebral edema worsening hepatic encephalopathy seizures and it prolongs icu stay prolongs ventilation and there is chance of infection higher mortality with ammonia so the persistent hyperammonia is associated with complications poor outcomes in patients with liver failure uh, next uh, protein catabolism so patients with acute liver failure they have higher energy expenditure which is similar to like uh, patients with sepsis so these patients feeding in these patients is very important one and may patients with uh, hepatic encephalopathy grade 1 grade 2 they can be given oral nutrition but uh, there are high chances of patients uh, worsening to grade 3 grade 4 who may require intubation and the chances of aspiration their sensorium may be borderline chances of aspiration so uh, insertion of nasogastric tube is important in those patients who sensorium is borderline and and there is this nasogastric tube is also associated with the risk of bleeding so and early introduction of enteral feeding will minimize the loss of muscle mass and reduce a chance of muscle necrosis and lipid emulsions are also safe uh, nowadays uh, so one more thing in some patients with significant mitochondrial dysfunction lipids may not be metabolized and may accumulate which may worsen liver injury so amounts of calories and proteins so aim is to provide 20 to 25 kilocalories per kg per day and proteins 1 to 1.5 grams per kg per day and total volume of feeds needs to be carefully monitored so feeding when to start and route so as early as possible we have to start feeding as early as possible and enteral route is preferred and nasogastric tube insertion can increase intracranial pressure because of gagging and ng tube placement should uh, generally performed when the patient is sedated or intubated and parental nutrition should be based upon overall nutritional status and and uh, calorie intake of the patient so in recent studies they have demonstrated they didn't demonstrate any benefit of initiating tpn prior to day 5 or day 7 of critical care presentation and so management of organ specific uh, complications so uh, this ne uh, neurologically cerebral edema hepatic encephalopathy it is the most common complication in acute liver failure so it is characterized by decreased level of consciousness and uh, other additional manifestations they may include uh, seizures vomiting asterixis hyperreflexia clonus everything so before diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy it is important to rule out other causes of neurological disturbance like hypoglycemia hypercapnia non convulsive seizures uh, intracranial bleed because these patients they have they are having co coagulopathy so any sedation and other causes so these are the important things we have to monitor uh, in hepatic encephalopathy so so once the patient is progressing to grade 3 grade 4 hepatic encephalopathy it's important uh, to intubate and uh, put them, put the patients on mechanical ventilation because it will protect airway and uh, prevents aspiration. This thing. And one more thing, there is a concern of seizures in patients with hepatic encephalopathy and cerebral edema. So EEG monitoring may also be required. And there is no role of prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs in these patients. And the preferred anti-epileptics, if the patient is having any findings, any non-convulsive, any seizure episode, uh, levetiracetam or lacosamide are the preferred 
frequently used anti epileptics and the therapeutic options for uh, rise icp they include routine um, measures like elevation of head at 30 degrees avoidance of fever hypoglycemia hyperglycemia and maintaining serum sodium levels these are the important things we need to take care of and sudden surges in intracranial pressure or development of any new clinical signs they are to be treated with hypotonic saline boluses or intravenous mannitol and sometimes hyperventilation may also be required and steroids are generally not recommended and and the non invasive measurement of hepatic encephalopathy it is done by optic nerve sheath diameter and other clinical parameters and invasive uh, monitoring like bolting and uh, reverse transjugular catheterization all this it's associated with high complications so and uh, prophylactic antibiotics as i have already discussed prophylactic antibiotics there are there is no role and uh, in patients requiring any anti epileptic levetiracetam and lacosamide is the safest ones and non absorbable antibiotics like rifaximin and lactose parenteral lola there is no evidence for use and maintain serum sodium around 145 to 150 and if there is sudden surge in icp mannitol or hypotonic saline bolus so therapeutic hypothermia there is no benefit no survival benefit with therapeutic hypothermia in acute liver failure patients and renal issues renal issues are the important things so uh, these patients they have high risk of uh, developing acute liver failure acute renal failure so 40 to 80% of patients they develop uh, acute renal failure and it is associated with increased mortality and uh, prolonged duration of hospital stay and the risk factors include increased age uh, acetaminophen poisoning hypotension presence of infection cell response so it is important to decide when to initiate rrt so general indications uh, what we routinely do metabolic acidosis fluid overload hyperkalemia uremia these are the things we generally uh, general indications for initiation of rrt but in acute liver failure even there for correction of hyperammonemia and sodium imbalance sometimes metabolic control facilitate facilitate temperature control this rrt it can be initiated so in rrt crrt is preferred to intermittent dialysis because uh, they help in avoiding large metabolic or hemodynamic fluctuations so and one more thing anticoagulation for dialysis is a very important thing in patients with acute liver failure so generally no anticoagulation or regional citrate Uh, there is little data which recommend regional citrate uh, which is safest and the most efficacious in patients with acute liver failure but in patients with cirrhosis they may tolerate citrate and coagulation but patients with acute liver failure hyperacute liver failure may be less able to metabolize citrate load and and it is important to close monitoring of calcium in these patients and uh, and recovery renal recovery some predictive factors include a lower and lower level med scores patients with admission hypotension patients with lower grades of ak these are the possible factors which help in fully recovering of renal function so with uh, crrt uh, ammonia levels we can come uh, come down and respiratory issues so you have to sedate the patient with propofol and low tidal volume is preferred minimum peep is preferred like a low tidal volume 6 to 8 ml per kg and minute ventilation is titrated to target pco of 30 to 40 with avoidance of hypocarbia and hypercarbia and there is no role of prophylactic hyperventilation and uh, regarding suctioning suctioning should be done uh, less frequently because and it should be done with insufflation of 1 to 2 ml of lidocaine with prior 100% oxygen before suctioning to prevent acute surges in uh, intracranial pressure when there is refractory hypoxemia ecmo may be indicated so cardiovascular issues these patients 
are generally volume depleted so it's very important to uh, carefully assess the volume fluid status of these patients and mostly uh, first initial days fluid management is how we do we assess fluid management in patients with liver failure it's by most probably by pulse contour device but because scvo2 this may be falsely high in patients with acute liver failure and which fluid is preferred there is no specific guidelines which fluid is preferred but uh, crit general critical care literature it, uh, it it supports use of crystallite or colloid and hyperchloremia we should take care of hyperchloremia should be avoided so uh, when the most of the patients with liver failure they are volume depleted requiring crystallite volume depletion and even after adequate fluid resuscitation if the hypotension is persisting uh, we need to start vasopressors and the norepinephrine is the most preferred vasopressor and ideal map there are no guidelines which uh, tell us this is the adequate map so generally appropriate blood pressure range to target is this is highly controversial and uh, there is no evidence in a young patients without pre existing hypertension mean arterial pressure of 65 may be adequate but in patients who are at risk of aki there is some evidence that map should be maintained more than 75 and this is because in those patients baseline blood pressure would be high so and and in patients with profound and um severe cardiac dysfunction extra corporal support with va ecmo may be appropriate and in the regarding the role of steroids whether there is benefit of giving any steroid in these patients but there are no mortality studies uh mortality benefit but it reduces vasopressor requirements so how do you prognosticate uh, patients in pay with acute liver failure and when to refer for transplantation these are the few criteria which uh, give us a clue when to refer a patient to specialized units so in paracetamol and other hyperacute etiologies arterial ph of less than 7.3 and bicarbonate of less than 18 inr of more than 3 and a2 or more than 4 thereafter oliguria elevated creatinine altered levels of consciousness hypoglycemia elevated lactates despite fluid resuscitation and in non paracetamol uh, ph of less than 7.3 bicarb of less than 18 inr of more than 1.8 oliguria renal failure encephalopathy hypoglycemia metabolic acidosis bilirubin of more than 17.6 shrinking liver size these are the criteria which give us a clue to when to refer the patient to liver transplantation unit so when to list for liver transplantation this is the most difficult decision because uh, most of the patients in indian setup they come very late and there is a very scanty background information and it's associated with high mortality so ideal time it is very important because delay will result in untransplantable situation with the onset of sepsis septic shock other things and too early decision to transplant will result in unnecessary transplant that is high cost case set of donors and surgical risk so uh, we should have some scores to decide when to transplant so the ideal prognostic score score should be simple it should be rapidly measured accurately predicts progression and it should be reproducible and ident identify patients earlier before onset of multi organ dysfunction and it should be highly sensitive and specific with high positive predictive value and negative predictive value so perfect score should have 100% sensitivity and specificity but, but there are no scores with 100% sensitivity and specificity so this is one criteria kings college criteria uh, to decide when to go for liver transplantations in patients with liver failure so in paracetamol poisoning the ph of less than 7.3 arterial lactate of more than 3.5 net 4 hours or more than 3 at 12 hours pt of more than 100 seconds with inr greater than 5, 
and serum creatinine more than 3.4 mg per deciliter, grade 3, grade 4 encephalopathy. So, and in non paracetamol cases, prothrombin time greater than 100, irrespective of grade of encephalopathy, or any three of the following conditions, like age less than 7 year, 11 years or greater than 40 years, etiology of non A, non B hepatitis, halothin hepatitis, and idiosyncratic drug reactions, duration of jaundice of more than 7 days before onset of encephalopathy, prothrombin time greater than 50 seconds, INR of more than 3.5, and Serum build up in greater than 17 mg per deciliter. This alpha model is one more score. In this, uh, these are the following variables are considered hepatic encephalopathy, which is which might be persistent or progress to grade more than grade two. And a score aligned for it is two INR increased to more than or equal to five, and arterial ammonia increased to more than 1.3 micromoles per liter, and serum build up in increased to more than 15, more than or equal to 15. So, Alfred scores total score was calculated for each patient, and by adding together a total scores, it is high risk as the higher the score, uh, survival is very less. So, and this is the comparative performance of different uh, scores Alfred model, King's College criteria, and Mel scores. Among these, Alfred score, it has better specificity and better positive predictive value, negative predictive value compared to King's College score, which has a specificity of 72% and positive predictive value of 63 and negative predictive value of 72. So this is a meta-analysis which show performance of uh, King's College criteria in predictive outcome of patients with non-paracetamol induced acute liver failure. So sensitivity is this 0.68 and the specificity is 82. And regarding NAC, the dose of NAC, uh, it's given 150 mg per kg per hour over one hour. Then 12.5 mg per kg per hour for four hours and 6.25 mg per kg per hour for next six to seven hours. So extracorporeal therapies in liver failure. So it's now possible to support the patient with liver failure till the liver recovers or liver transplantation is feasible. So extracorporeal liver assistivities, they have been developed to bridge the patient to transplantation or temporarily support the failing organ until it is able to regenerate. So the artificial liver support device, non-cell based liver support device systems include molecular absorption, recirculating system that's Mars, and fractionated plasma suppression and absorption, Prometheus, single pass albumin dialysis, and therapeutic plasma exchange. So the key functions of liver devices, uh, artificial devices, they just remove the accumulated toxins and they allow natural process of recovery. Whereas bioartificial devices, they have, along with toxin removal, they have synthetic functions. So Improvement in survival rate, including bridge to survival and bridge to liver transplant. There are no studies which uh, shows improvement in survival rate. So the pros of artificial liver support systems, relatively easy to use. Uh, they ameliorate pathophysiological features and and cons include lack of synthetic functions, inspecificity in removal of some compounds and cost. By artificial, they provide, they have potential to provide synthetic functions and cons, they are a cell source need for critical bioactive mass, complex technology, technology and potential xenotransmission and cost. So this is the same thing. And molecular adaptive and recirculating system mass. So it's first available in clinical use since 1998. And the basis for this principle is protein binding affinity, solute movement along concentration gradient. So the combination of conventional dialysis against almond dialysis is utilized, followed by traditional procedure to remove the toxins. So it is composed of blood circuit, almond circuit, that is 60 ml of 20% albumin, charcoal column, anion exchange column, and a classic renal circuit. The first blood pass, blood is passed through this almond impregnated high flux dialysis membrane 
in such a way that a water soluble albumin bound toxins are released so removal of toxin takes place uh, albumin dialysate is then recycled eliminating the need for continuous infusion of albumin and it also eliminates cytokines and modulate inflammatory response in patients with uh, inflammatory response involved in liver failure but uh, anti inflammatory cytokines should also be removed and the final imbalance and its contribution to multi organ failure is still unknown so advantages of mars effective and selective removal of water soluble protein bound toxins management of fluid electrolyte acid base balance control of glucose lactate level and safety barrier there is safety barrier between blood and absorber columns highly biocompatible membrane minimal staff handling and cost effective online regeneration of albumin and it is co- compatible with our crrt monitor response crrt monitors so these are the studies uh, which uh, clinical endpoints of acute liver failure using mars so in all the studies there is no improvement in survival there is only neurological or hemodynamic improvement and uh, improvement in encephalopathy in hemodynamic improvement other than that there is no study which shows survival benefit so second one is prometheus this is fractionated plasma suppression and absorption it was first described by falkenhagen and the patient blood first passes through albuflow albuflow filter so here the plasma is filtered and passes into second circuit where albumin bound toxins are removed and the albumin is reactivated returned to circulation using a natural resin absorber that is prometh 1 and an an exchange column that is prometh 2 and the blood then enters high flux hemodialysis circuit where it is treated to remove water soluble toxins before being returned to the patient this is first albu flow filter where uh, albumin bound toxins they are removed then the water soluble toxins are removed in the dialysis circuit so even the studies with clinical endpoints using prometheus these are also there is no improvement in 28 day to 90 day survival rate and there is only biochemical improvement and improvement in hemodynamics and there might be improvement in hepatic encephalopathy but there is no study which supports there is 28 day 90 day survival benefit and single pass albumin dialysis is the simplest artificial liver device described alternative to mars in late 1990s and the patient blood uh, is analyzed through a high flux called fiber hemodialysis filter using an albumin containing dialysate so after passing through the dialyzer dialysate is discarded and toxins are removed from system and the disadvantage is high amounts of albumin are consumed with this single pass albumin dialysis and there were no significant differences in biochemical hemodynamic clinical values and only few case reports are published in the earlier years and there are no published studies that focus on demonstrating clinical benefits of single pass albumin dialysis and standard medical therapy so there is a spawn holes at all comparison of spad and mars so similar reduction in total plasma bilirubin levels and reduction in total bile acids and glutamyl transferases were not significant and creatinine neural levels are not significantly reduced with spad and metabolic derangement such as increased lactate and hypocalcemia were not significantly reduced and effect of mars and spad and clinical parameters were small and equivalent and therapeutic plasma exchange so it dates back 1960 uh, first employed in cirrhosis to treat hepatic encephalopathy so therapeutic plasma exchange requires extra uh, corporeal removal of large compounds from blood that is albumin bound water soluble toxins and replacement with plasma or albumin and the therapeutic difference in plasma exchange extra corporeal assist device is uh this plasma exchange is capable of removing larger molecular proteins including antibiotics immune complex and lipoproteins but there is no data which uh compares plasma exchange with extra corporeal assist devices so the advantage is it removes all molecules even if large substitutes plasma products 
coagulation factors augment hemoglobin improves hemodynamics increases planking blood flow increases septal perfusion pressure and septal blood flow no adverse effect on intracranial pressure and it is very helpful in improving hepatic encephalopathy and disadvantages uh, unselective removal substances and it requires donor plasma and limited transport of water soluble substances so larsen study uh, it has studied high volume plasma exchange in patients with acute liver failure in this it's a multicentric randomized control trial which has assigned 182 patients in with patients of alf to either standard medical therapy or standard medical therapy with a high volume plasma exchange so high volume plasma therapeutic plasma exchange is defined as plasma replacement at least 15% of ideal body weight or 8 to 10 liters per session that removes 90 to 98% of toxins and it has been done for a maximum of 3 sessions so primary end point was liver transplantation free survival during hospital stay and second end points include survival after liver transplantation with or without high volume paracentesis so it has shown to reduce levels of circulating cytokines inflammatory cytokines improves hemodynamics improves plant transplant free survival and in subgroup uh, in patients with comparing high volume therapeutic plasma exchange with standard medical therapy there is improved map and reduction in vasopressor support required fewer renal replacement therapy and they have shown to reduce ammonia levels and improved rates of hepatic encephalopathy and there is significant improvement in liver transplant free survival with no difference in outcome between paracetamol and non paracetamol etl for alf and in subgroup it, it was shown to improve survival among patients who are not listed for liver transplantation and there is no significant survival benefit in patients who received this therapeutic plasma exchange as opposed to liver transplant there is benefit in the, only those patients where upfront upfront liver transplantation was done but it is not it didn't show any survival benefit in patients Uh, in which this plasma exchange is done as a bridge to liver transplantation so the results overall survival was 58% for patients with treated with high volume plasma exchange and compared to 47.8% for the control group so high volume plasma exchange prior to transplantation did not improve survival compared with patients with who received standard medical therapy alone and the incidence of adverse events was similar in both the groups sars and sofa scores fell in the treated group compared to control group over the study period so these are the some of the guidelines and the 2019 american society for aphrasis has recommended high volume therapeutic plasma exchange as a first line therapy for acute liver failure and fulminant wilson disease and in alf it recommends asfa recommends performing at least three high volume plasma exchange procedures to consider performing daily treatments until liver transplant or liver recovery and in fulminant wilson disease daily standard volume plasma exchange treatments until liver transplant or liver recovery is recommended and 2016 european association for study of liver disease recommended this high volume tp as a level 1 grade 1 evidence in acute liver failure but no recommendation has been made for acute and chronic liver failure In the 2011 American Association for Study of Liver Diseases, they have suggested plasma exchange as a means to acutely lower serum copper, limit copper-mediated kidney damage in Wilsonian acute liver failure. However, there are no recommendations made for the general use of uh, plasma exchange in acute liver for failure or acute and chronic liver failure. And the artificial liver support devices available. liver assist devices artificial or bio artificial they have failed to either make an impact or as, as a bridge to liver transplant or improve transplant free survival so one of the bio artificial liver hepat assist so arbus first described bio artificial liver devices so it works on the concept of combining hepatocyte bio reactor with a column filled with cultured hepatocytes to mimic liver function so in this the patient's blood is first separated into plasma and cellular components and the plasma is then passed through this high flow plasma circulation loop 
and then through a charcoal filter, oxygenator heater, and hollow fiber bioreactor containing 7 billion cryopreserved heptocytes. And the processed plasma then combines with cellular components and sent back to patient's brain. This is the thing. So, Atanabe et al., 31 patients were enrolled in phase one study with goal of developing um, well for patients with severe acute liver failure until they can be transplanted or record spontaneously. And 16 out of 18 patients were successfully bridged to liver transplant. And group two patients all were successfully bridged to transplantation. And in group three, with sample size of 10, they had two patients who were supposed to recovery and transplant. Remaining 8%, they were expired as they were not candidates for liver transplant. So phase two and phase three clinical trials from multiple centers across US and European centers, they involved 171 patients with 86 patients as controls and 85 treated to study the efficacy of device, this device in patients with acute liver failure. And the inclusion criteria with stage three, stage four, hepatic encephalopathy are primary non-function of transplanted liver. So groups were randomized, receiving standard of care and daily treatment with hepatitis for seven hours. Results for this trial were inconclusive and failed to show an improvement in 30-day survival rates, although a good safety profile was noted. And subgroup analysis indicated that this hepatitis section might provide an improvement in survival rate in patients with drug and chemical toxic induced liver failure. And one more thing, ELAD, extracorporeal liver assist device. This was first described by Sussman. It consists of heptoblastoma C3A cell line derived from human heptoblastoma cell lines, FG2. And cells are localized in the extracapillary space of modified dialysis cartridge to prevent immunoglobulins, blood cells, and C3A tumor cells from crossing. So pilot control study done by Ellis et al. in King's College for patients with reticular failure were judged to have greater than 50% survival. And in those who are already indicated for liver transplant. And 24 patients were randomly divided into two groups of ELAD hemoperfusion and control. Overall survival rate in ELAD hemoperfusion group was 7 of 978%. And survival rate in control was 6 of 8, 75% due to small sample size. So the study failed to prove an improvement in survival rate of patients with acute liver failure. So Millis et al. They studied a modified version of ELAD to determine safety profile of the device for patients with permanent hepatic failure. All the patients successfully had a liver transplant with four out of five patients surviving 30-day survival endpoint of city with no noted biomechanical or hemodynamic instability. And the authors, they have concluded that ELAD is safe and can be conducted on larger scale in multi-center randomized control trials. So this is the, uh, all the compar comparison of all the things artificial devices and bioartificial devices. These extracorporeal supports, these are, uh, they, all the extracorporeal supports, they didn't show any survival benefit. And and for ELADs, there is larger studies are required. And, and they, they are very useful in patients when they come very early. Uh, and one more thing, along with the pro-inflammatory cytokines, Anti-inflammatory cytokines are also removed. And the patients, there is no specific demarcation whether the patients are in pro-inflammatory phase or anti-inflammatory phase. Because some cytokines, is, they may be useful for regeneration of liver. So there is no exact uh, survival benefit with all the support devices. So when not to consider for liver transplantation? And the patient is improving clinically and when there is more than three organ failures, that is circulatory failure with requirement of two vasopressors, both with limited response to further dose escalation and severe respiratory failure requiring maximum ventilator support, that is a out of more than 0.8 high peep or an ECMO who should be, should be considered as contraindications for liver transplant and ongoing severe sepsis, tissue invasive fungal infection or relative contraindications for liver transplant. However, uh, we can still consider patients with sepsis after controlling the infection. And brain death and absence of brainstem reflexes are absolute contraindications of liver transplant. 
so in pregnancy help syndrome and acute fatty liver of pregnancy first thing we have to deliver the baby and then treat the patients in terms of normal patients with acute liver failure and the mortality of pregnant patients with acute liver failure is similar to that of non pregnant women and girls and independent of cause or trimester and pregnancy per se should not be regarded as a poor prognostic factor for patient with acute liver failure so outcome of patients with different etiology hepatitis c it has the highest survival rate compared to other things hepatitis a hepatitis c so uh, att related it has very less survival of 30% and hpv reactivation it has a survival rate of 36.29% so uh, in cost specific treatment so in hepatitis b virus we start on antivirals and uh, liver failure caused by att will stop att and uh, will modify will prescribe modified att so and att induced liver failure so mortality is 69.5% and it's more common in females than males so uh, empirical att is a risk factor so general alf protocol so whenever a patient comes with acute liver failure with a high suspicion of acute liver failure admit to icu there is con continuous monitoring non invasive calculate alfed scores and the general measures like 20 to 30% or uh, 20 to 30 degree head up chest sensor prophylaxis inotropic support to target a, a map of 60 65 mm hg and elective ventilation in patients with cerebral edema and uh, grade 4 encephalopathy and venous lines they have to be carefully handled and sugar levels monitoring of sugar levels every second hourly prophylactic antibiotics those patients who are listed for emergency liver transplantation and uh, in other patients there is no role of pro any role of prophylactic antibiotics so uh, feeding freezing is an important thing with carbohydrates of 40 to 50% and protein 20 to 25% lipids 25 30% and liver transplantation counseling from the time of admission so this is the thing ic admission continuous monitoring baseline assessment vitals prognostic scores organ failure supportive care nac crt and there is worsening parameters of prognostic scores and donor is available we go with liver transplantation if there is no donor uh, this liver support devices and improving parameters continuous support care and uh, delist them from liver transplantation so this is my topic thank you kalsham jai shri vas Yeah. Uh, thank you, Narayana, uh, you know, for taking us through the overall management of uh, acute liver failure. I think among the different different organ failures, this is one organ failure where uh, you know it, it's 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 complex management, uh, you know, uh, and uh, a lot of emphasis on the general uh, ICU principles. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, one is. Uh, see a lot of us uh, kind of uh, tend to rely heavily on ammonia when you have patients with acute uh, liver failure uh, just uh, just a word of caution ammonia is one of the uh, multiple nitrogenous uh, waste compounds which is involved in the pathogenesis of uh, uh, acute liver failure induced uh, hepatic encephalopathy now we tend to rely heavily on ammonia because it's easily measurable there are large number of uh, non measurable uh, uh, nitrogenous waste Uh, so even if your ammonia is normal that does not mean that the patient does not have hepatic encephalopathy and we know that there are multiple uh, fallacies in the way you actually collect send the sample to the lab and measure it so just keep a watch on that uh, in india apart from yes viral infections at least what we are seeing of late is uh, a good number of uh, toxin induced uh, acute liver failures especially patients with uh, rat poisoning we had a couple of patients uh you know plasma exchange did help us give uh, time uh, wherein a transplant was uh, successful and uh, gave us some time so that the patient could be prepared for transplant uh 
among a lot of things uh, one of the major reasons why patients with acute liver failure die is because of the raised intracranial pressures mm-hmm. so the general neurocritical care uh, principles way you try to decrease the icp or prevent uh, rapid fluctuations or increase in icp should be uh, you know kept in mind when you're managing patients with uh, fulminant and acute uh, liver failure and those are a couple of points which is more to highlight Yeah. Uh, thank you, Narayan. Thank you, Shankar. I think uh, permanent hepatic failure is something which we have begun to understand a little more uh, in detail in the last five six years. Um, we have under, we have now access to some kind of non-invasive ICP monitoring. We now have access to uh, supporting these patients with extrapathological techniques. So the outcomes probably will be better. Uh, Whenever we talk of acute liver failure uh, in the intensive care setting, we need to keep uh, in mind that tropical diseases in India are a very significant part. Although they don't produce hepatocellular failure like the hyperacute or the uh, subacute failure, but hepatic failure is known to happen in leptospirosis. It's known to happen in streptitis, irrespective of whether they produce septic shock. So it should come very high in the uh, differential diagnosis. And when you talk about drug-induced lung injury, uh, drug-induced liver injury, uh, most often we talk about paracetamol and uh, those drugs, but some common drugs which are used in the intensive care unit, for example, amiodarone, for example, for azoles for antifungal therapy, for example, these are all drugs which have a detrimental effect on a mildly compromised liver and can worsen liver failure and make it a hepatic failure. So we should keep uh, these things also in mind when we talk about drug injury, uh, lung injury, the liver injury. The, the role of MS style system has again become an important uh, point of discussion amongst the critical care hepatology circles. So uh, uh, even in non, uh, even in non uh, uh, paracetamol induced uh, liver injury, there is. A, a emerging role and some guidance in, have included the role of MS style system in non uh, non drug induced uh, non paracetamol liver injury yes. also. So we should remember that. But it's an excellent uh, crisp um, presentation. Uh, thank, you. thank you all for joining us. Next week we'll be back with another topic. Uh, till then, uh, take care. And if you have any queries on this topic, please post them on the same group. Uh, in which you got this link from and the moderator or the speaker uh, will try to answer those questions to the best of our students. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, sir.